Okay, so let's begin by quickly reviewing where we left off in the last lecture. Uh, so remember last week we ended by spending the, the, the second lecture for the week discussing in, in detail this notion of uh, a Fourier sign series. And so the general problem we were considering was suppose you're given a, a function, say phi of x, right? And so the question is when is it possible to write phi as a sum of some combination of, of sine waves that are oscillating at, at different frequencies, uh, some discrete collection of frequencies. And in particular, we had the formula sum over n, n is going from one to infinity, uh, sine of n times pi over l times x, where l is like the length of, of your interval, right? So x is between zero and l. And so the question was, uh, which arose when we were looking at, at certain boundary value problems was, well, is it possible to write a, an, an arbitrary function phi of x in this way? We still don't know the answer to that question. Uh, the other question which we did address was, well, suppose you know that your function phi of x is given to you by this formula. Uh, again, from the motivation from studying the boundary value problem for, for the wave and diffusion equations, we expect that we need phi to be of this form in order to solve the in order to actually write down a solution to the partial differential equation. Then the question is, well, how do you calculate these coefficients? And so we answered that question by developing a notion of orthogonality for, for functions with certain boundary conditions. Uh, and then we, we use this, this concept of orthogonality or perpendicular functions being somehow perpendicular to, to derive the formula for, for an. Uh, and so for the first part of, of this lecture, I want to do the same thing, but now for, for series involving cosines. And so these turn out to be equally important. And then after we discuss this theory in a little bit of detail, we're going to combine everything uh, to look at the what's called a, a Fourier series, which combines like the sine and the cosine terms. Uh, and so at the end of the last lecture, we already began discussing uh, the, the cosine analog. And so the motivation is the following. Again, the, the, these problems are all motivated by problems from, from studying partial differential equations and in particular boundary value problems. And so in this case, the boundary value problem to look at is the diffusion equation. So we have ut minus k uxx is equal to zero. Again, we're on a bounded region between uh, zero and L. And while well, time is unbounded, time can just be bigger than zero. Uh, but notice we're changing the boundary conditions instead of, remember for the sine problem, we had u of zero t is equal to u of lt uh, is equal to zero for all t, right? So this is like the standard zero boundary condition. Uh, so for the Neumann boundary condition, instead you require that the derivatives are zero. Uh, sorry, this should say equal to zero, right? So we're requiring that, that the first derivative with respect to x uh, is equal to zero at both x equals zero and x equals l for all time t, right? Okay, and you can solve this problem using separation of variables as we've seen for, for several examples previously. Uh, so this problem is on your, your homework for, which is due at the end of this week, uh, it's on homework six. Uh, you just use the I mean, it'll be very similar to the other, the other separation of variables examples we've looked at, and in particular, the, the calculation you did in detail on, on homework three. Uh, and so in this case, if you, once you apply the method, you see that you expect the general solution looks very similar to what we saw for the, the zero boundary value problem without the Neumann conditions, uh, but instead you have cosine terms instead of sine terms arising here. And also there's, a, there's some coefficient corresponding to n equals zero, right? And so in particular, this means that, right, if I write down, well, let's look at u of, uh, actually, no, never mind. Right? So I mean, the, the main point that I just wanted to, the main thing I just wanted to point out is that, uh, there could be a coefficient corresponding to n equals zero, which, which was not the case for the sine term, uh, mainly just because, well, when, when x is equal to zero, we expect the, the function to be, uh, to be zero for, the, for the, the boundary value problem associated to sine. 
Okay, and so what we're going to do is 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 go through uh, something similar to what we did with the sign series and talk about well, for one, uh, what, is there a formula for these coefficients, right? So assuming that I know my function can be written in this way, uh, how do I find the coefficients, right? And so this is going to have a very similar uh, answer to the to what we looked at for, for the case of sign series. Uh, so one thing to point out is well, let's suppose that I have an initial condition, which you typically will need in order to say anything more meaningful about the solution, right? So suppose at time zero, my, my function is equal to phi of x, and I plug in this formula. Well, if I plug in t equals zero to this formula, I get the following. Uh, well, I need phi of x is equal to one half a zero. Well, the first term doesn't depend on, on t, so that just stays. And then, well, if I plug in t equals zero to this infinite sum, the only thing that depends on t is the exponential term. And when I plug in t equals zero, I have e to the power zero, so I get one for that. And so I just end up with uh, sum from n equals one to infinity of a n times cosine of n pi over Lx. And so this is what's called a, a, a cosine Fourier series. or a Fourier cosine series if you switch the order. I mean, it'll be written in, in right? You'll see people write this in different orders. Uh, right, and so what we're gonna, what we're gonna talk about is, is how to find a formula for an. The formula is gonna be very similar to what we saw for the, the sine case. Uh, and in fact, it's gonna use the same idea. Um, the first thing I wanted to talk about though before we do that is, well, remember before we derive the formula for the, the the coefficient in the case of the sine series, we talked about uh, some connections with linear algebra. And in particular, we talked about this notion of, a, of an eigenfunction, which is kind of like an eigenvector for the differential operator. And so I just want to talk about the, the analog here. Uh, and so you'll remember that when we mentioned this, I pointed out that it's very important to keep, the, keep uh, track of what the boundary conditions and the domain of the operator are, because this can affect what the eigenfunctions are. And we're going to see why now with, with this example uh, for the cosine case. Okay, so I just want to talk about eigenfunction interpretation. And so we're going to consider uh, the differential operator, which will be the same as what we looked at in the last example. So I'll call A is. Uh, Uh, minus second derivative with respect to x, right? So this means that it's a differential operator, which means I apply it to functions to get a new function. And the rule is, well, you take the second derivative with respect to x, and that's the, the output of the operator. Uh, and so here's going to be, so this is the same operator we, we, we looked at in the previous lecture. The new, or the change is going to be the domain, right? So we're no longer going to be considering this operator with zero boundary conditions as we did for uh, for the case of sine series, we're going to be considering it with Neumann boundary conditions, which is more uh, reasonable for the, for this, for the Neumann PDE problem, right? Right, so we're gonna be considering domain of functions, uh, let's say on, on zero, x is between zero and L, with Neumann boundary conditions. Right, and so the, the, the functions will satisfy, well, if I take the x derivative at zero, this should be equal to zero. And if I take the x derivative at L, this should also be equal to zero, right? But, right, since we're not assuming the, the, the boundary conditions from before, we, we could have uh, phi of zero not equal zero or phi of L not equal zero, right? Right, and so again, the, the key new difference with this example is the, the domain has changed, right? Because now we're considering, instead of imposing the previous boundary conditions, we're now imposing the new Neumann boundary conditions. And so this is gonna end up affecting what, what the admissible eigenfunctions are, right? And so, well, for example, recall, uh, 
So if right, so for for this operator a, uh, we looked at these functions sine of n pi over l x, which we called v n of x. Uh, it's certainly true that if I if I apply a to these functions, we saw that well you get something like in, like the eigenvalue formula, so you get uh, n pi over l squared uh, times vn of x, right? And so this is like the, the eigenfunction formula, which should remind you of the eigenvalue formula from linear algebra, which is, right, so you apply a matrix A to a vector and you get some lambda times, times the vector. Uh, right, so these were, were eigenfunctions. But they were eigenfunctions for the problem with uh, the zero boundary condition, not the Neumann condition. Right. And so in particular, well, we can check just by differentiating that these functions Vn of x or the sine of n pi over L times x, these functions do not satisfy the, the Neumann boundary conditions. So for the problem we're considering now, they're not in the domain of, of the operator, right? So notice that well, if I take derivative with respect to x of, of vn of x, right? this is derivative with respect to x of sine of n pi over l x. Derivative of sine is cosine, and then I have to use the, the chain rule. So I get n pi over l uh, times cosine of n pi over l at x. And so if I look at uh, the derivative with respect to x of vn at zero, this is just n pi over l times cosine of zero, which is not zero, right? This is n pi over l, which is not zero, right? Because n is bigger than or equal to one. And so these are not, uh, not in the domain, right? So let me call this domain d. Uh, for the for the Neumann problem, right? So the point, and so this is just to, to further elaborate on the point I made in the last lecture. Uh, the point is that the domain is very important for the problem that you're 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 interested in, right? We didn't change the operator. We're still looking at the the same operator from the last example, but we're imposing different boundary conditions, and so it's going to turn out that the new boundary conditions require possibly different eigenfunctions. Right, so the, the eigenfunctions we had from last time, it's still true that if I apply the operator, I get a constant multiple times the function, but they are not, they don't give me, they don't have the same boundary conditions, right? And so in particular, if I wanna solve, if I wanna use these eigenfunctions to find a solution to this partial differential equation with the Neumann boundary conditions, the sine functions are not gonna work because if I take any combination of those, they're not going to satisfy the Neumann condition. They satisfy a different boundary condition, right? So the sort of the the the, the summary is that the the boundary condition you're working with for your boundary value problem will impose restrictions on on what type of of eigenfunctions you'll work with, which relates to like what type of infinite series you'll be getting as your as your solution formula, uh, right? And so in particular, well, you can hopefully maybe kind of guess that just from like similarity, we would expect that the eigenfunctions for the Neumann problem are not sine of n pi over L, but instead cosine of n pi over L. And so this is gonna turn out to be, to be the case. Uh, so I'm not gonna elaborate too much on it. I'll just kind of, we'll just kind of check that they work. Uh, right, so let me just call this, uh, I guess I can call this a theorem. Right, so I'll break it up into, into two parts. So the first part is uh, the functions, uh, let me call them, instead of V, since I used V before, let me call them W and of X, which are given by cosine of N pi over, over L times X. Uh, so these are eigenfunctions for the operator A, 
uh, on the on the domain D with with Neumann boundary value problem value Neumann boundary conditions. Right. So that's the first part of the theorem, and then the second part is the uh, the orthogonality, the analog of the orthogonality result, uh, which is if I look at the integral from zero to L of uh, cosine of say n pi over L times x times cosine. So I, I look at the product of two of these eigenfunctions. And I integrate them on the domain, right? So, and then, well, I have to scale. So let's say I, I scale by two over L, then this is equal to one in the case where M, M and N are equal and it's equal to zero otherwise, right? So there's like the same formula we had for, for the, sign, uh, the sign eigenfunctions and the, and the other boundary value problem. Uh, so with the or orthogonality notion is, is preserved. Uh, Right, and, and one thing, right, so let's let's prove this theorem. Uh, one thing I want to just remark, well, what happens, we're allowing, we're allowing n equals zero here, right? So n can equal zero, one, two, three, up to infinity. Uh, so in the n equals zero case, well, when I plug in n equals zero, I get cosine of zero, which is one. Uh, so the function uh, one is, is an eigenfunction. That's, that's part of the, the, the claim, which was not the case for the other boundary value problem we looked at it in the last lecture. Right. Okay, let's, let's just do a quick proof of, of this result. Uh, so let's first consider part one. Uh, the first thing to check, which is, which is easy, is that, well, if I take minus the second derivative with respect to x of cosine uh, n pi over l times x, this is equal to, uh, well, derivative of cosine is negative sine, and then the negative signs will cancel, so I get d dx, and then I have to use the chain rule, so n pi over l sine of n pi over lx, and then I take one more derivative, and I end up with uh, n pi over l squared uh, cosine n pi over lx. And so, right, so this says that uh, if I apply A to WN of X, I get uh, N pi over L squared uh, WN over X. And so this quantity here, which is sometimes denoted lambda N uh, is the, the eigenvalue, right? And so this shows that these functions uh, solve this this eigenvalue equation, right? So that's the first part. Uh, but the second thing that we want to check is not just that they solve the eigenvalue equation, but that they have the correct boundary conditions, right? We need the the Neumann boundary conditions. Otherwise, these functions are not in the the domain that we specified, uh, right? Remember, we specified this particular domain D. Okay, and so let's just quickly check. Uh, Right, so let's say I take derivative with respect to x of cosine of n pi over L x. This is going to be n pi over L negative uh, sine of n pi over L x, right? Well, when x is equal to zero, uh, this is, uh, well, sine of zero, I get negative n pi over L sine of zero. Sine of zero is zero, right? On the other hand, so that's that's the first condition, right? We want uh, zero derivative when x is equal to zero. We also want zero derivative when x is equal to L. Uh, well, when x is equal to L, we get uh, negative n pi over L, and then I have sine of n pi over L times L. So the Ls will cancel and I get sine of n pi. Uh, sine of n pi is always zero. Right. The sign of any integer multiple of pi is zero, so that's also zero, right? And so, right, so these are, are in the domain. 
right? And so when you're given like a, a differential operator with a domain that's specified to you with certain boundary conditions, if you want to check that some function is an eigenfunction, you have to check two things, right? You have to check that it solves this equation where if I apply the operator to the function, I get a scalar multiple of the function. And then the scalar multiple is the eigenvalue. But you also need to check that the functions under consideration are in your domain, right? So that's, that's very important. Uh, right, so that's, that's the proof of, of part one of, of the theorem. And then the second part is, is this notion of, of orthogonality. Uh, so this is just a, a, a trig integral calculation, which is very similar to what we did in the case of sines. Uh, so you're going to use the use the double angle formula to rewrite the integral in, in basically just the same way as we did with, with the sine case, but you just interchange the role of sines and cosines. Uh, so I'm going to omit that from, from this lecture, but if, if you want to see this in, in detail, I can do it during one of the Zoom meetings or in, or in office hours. Uh, so for part two, uh, it's a calculation that's very similar to what we saw in, in the last lecture. So I'm not gonna, yeah, I'm not gonna do that here. Okay, and then finally, well, now let's suppose, I have my function phi of x, which is given by one half a zero uh, plus, sum n equals one to infinity of uh, right. So I have my function function given by this uh, cosine series, and so what I'm going to do is well, and let's ignore the one half. Let's absorb the the one half into. Uh, into the, the definition of A0, right? A0 is just some constant. So one half times A0 is also a constant. So let me, I'm just gonna relabel things so that I don't have to worry about that, about the one half. Uh, so what we have here is exactly, this is exactly a, an eigenfunction decomposition in the sense we described last time. Right? So I'm, I'm writing phi as a sum from now n equals zero to infinity of a n times w n of x, where these are the, the eigenfunctions uh, for the operator a, which was minus, uh, minus second derivative with respect to x, right? And so, uh, well, well, remember, we also have, they're not just eigenfunctions, we have this orthogonality property, which we also had for sines, right? So these are uh, uh, orthogonal eigenfunctions for this operator on, on, the, on, the, on the Neumann boundary condition domain. Uh, right. And so this is exactly the analog of what we saw last time. Uh, if you look, if you view it, view the, the decomposition from a slightly more abstract level and think of it not as a sine series or a cosine series, but instead as an eigenfunction series where the eigenfunctions are orthogonal, it's the same formula that we saw last time, right? It's just that for these particular boundary conditions, you change the eigenfunction, uh, but otherwise it's the same formula for, for what B needs to be in order to solve the, the equation, right? It's the same, the same idea. Okay, and so the, the final question to address is, well, let's suppose we have an infinite sum like this, and let's suppose it converges and the function phi is equal to the sum. Uh, so then what are the coefficients a n, right? Well, since we have this decomposition and since the eigenfunctions have some notion of being perpendicular, you would expect the formula to be very similar to what we saw last time. And so this is the, the case, right? So if I look at, this particular a n, it's going to be given by, well, you have to, uh, you have to rescale to take into account the length of, of, of the interval. So we have to have this two over L factor, uh, but otherwise it's going to be uh, two over L times integral from zero to L uh, 
And what did we do last time? We multiplied the function phi by the eigenfunction. And so in this case, this is phi of x times cosine of n pi over l times x dx. Right? So this is the case if uh, phi of x has this form. Right, and so this is for n, sorry, this is for n bigger than or equal to one. Uh, and well, what is what is the n equals zero? Uh, Right, sorry, sorry, I'm not, I just confused myself with the deleting the, the one half and then. Uh, right, right, so if, if n equals zero, it's gonna be one over L times integral from zero to L of, of phi of x dx. Right, and so so this is going to be proved in in exactly the same way uh, as we saw last time. So the the proof idea is just well, uh, let's suppose phi of x. I can write phi as a sum from n equals zero to infinity of a n times times these eigenfunctions, and so if I look at the integral of phi of x times some eigenfunction say wm, where wm is again cosine of m pi over l times x, right? So this should be equal to the sum from n equals zero to infinity of the integral, again, this is from zero to l, of phi of x times, or sorry, of, of wn of x times wm of x dx, and so this is zero unless n is equal to m, right? And so therefore, uh, if I look at the integral from zero to L of phi of x times wm of x dx, this is equal to, well, the only non-zero term that appears in the infinite sum is when n is equal to m, right? So it's equal to the integral from zero to L of wn uh, of x, uh, sorry, wm, n and m are the same thing. So let me, but let me clarify, wm of x times itself, right? Since the other terms vanish. Well, then we saw previously, we know what that form, what this is equal to. So this is equal to L over two, right? So this is now equal to uh, L over two, this is just a trig calculation, which you have to do, or if you integrate, uh, so this is like cosine of, of M pi over L X squared. And so you have to use some trig identity. You can evaluate this. Um, right, sorry, sorry. Uh, when I, when I wrote this sum up here, there should have been an, an AN here, right? And so then the, the only coefficient that remains is the coefficient for AM, right? And so therefore this tells me that AM is two over L times integral from uh, zero to L of, of phi of X times WM of X. Right, and so this is in the case where, right, so if I integrate wm squared, this is when uh, m is not equal zero. Let's do the m equals zero case uh, independently, and this should clarify the confusion from before, so I apologize for that. 
Uh, well, in the m equals zero case, I'm looking at uh, integral from zero to L of phi of x times w zero of x dx, which is just one. And so this ends up being the sum from n equals zero to infinity of a n times integral from zero to L of, uh, of just w zero of x times w uh, n of x. And so just as before, this is zero unless, uh, unless n equals zero. Again, it's a, it's a similar calculation. And so you end up with, well, there's only the term corresponding to a zero. I have a zero times integral from zero to L of one dx. Uh, so this is uh, a zero times L. Right, and so this tells you that a zero is one over L times integral from zero to L of phi of x. W zero is one, so it's just phi of x dx, right? Right, so this is for m not equal zero. Right? And that, that's what I, I wrote up here, right? Okay. Sorry, I just want to double check the formula up here. Right, right. So you have to clarify in this theorem from earlier. So this is when this is in the case when when m is not equal zero. Uh, if m equals zero, of course, uh, it's still true that that if I have cosine of n pi over l times x times times one, then I integrate that, I get zero. Uh, the only difference is with uh, if I look at the case where I, I'm integrating uh, cosine of zero times cosine of, of zero from zero to l, that's not going to give me l over two. It's just going to give me l. Right, that's that's the one minor addition that okay. Uh, all right, so that's that's about it for what I wanted to say related to the, the theory of, of, of cosine Fourier series. Uh, So we're still going. We're still going to. We still haven't really done many calculations, which we'll we'll do some of at, at the end of this lecture and at the beginning of uh, of, of the next lecture. Uh, what I want to do now, though, is is try to put together the uh, the the two lines of investigation that that we've been been looking at in terms of Fourier uh, cosine series and Fourier sine series. And so it turns out for, for more general problems in, in math and also in just in partial differential equations, but in math more generally, you're not just interested in either a, a, a cosine Fourier series or a sine Fourier series, uh, because remember these respective objects are, are deeply connected to two specific boundary value problems. Uh, but in general, you may have different boundary conditions or you may be interested in, in another problem where you have to decompose your functions in this way. And so in this case, it helps to, uh, to combine the two notions. So we're going to talk about, talk about a full Fourier series. And so this is really just, I mean, it's, it's exactly what it says, what it sounds like. So we're going to combine the, the sine and, and cosine uh, Fourier series into one object. And so in this case, this is actually, uh, it's a bit of a jump. Maybe it'll become clear why we're doing this, uh, as the, as this, as our study of Fourier series progresses. Uh, so we're going to assume we're going to change the domain a little bit of, for the functions. So we're going to assume the domain is between instead of X bigger than zero, X is bigger than minus L and less than positive L, uh, unlike from before, right? So this is gonna help with, with symmetry, which makes some calculations easier. Uh, so, so previously, because we were motivated by the, the boundary value problem, we considered X between zero and L. Uh, 
right? And so this is something that the book does, so I need to, to match up with it. Uh, so maybe this is in, this could be potentially confusing. Uh, when for in this book, when we're talking about full Fourier series, which I'm about to define, the domain is always between minus L and L. And in particular, when we compute the Fourier coefficients, you're going, you're going to have to be integrating over this domain between minus L and L. On the other hand, for sine and cosine series, as we just looked at, the, the domain is between zero and L. So all the integrals are, are over zero to L. Uh, it's kind of an annoying technicality, which you're going to have to keep track of for, for a little bit. Uh, okay. okay, and so let's suppose that we're given a function phi of x, uh, which is defined on, say, uh, open interval between minus L and positive L. Uh, right, and so the definition, uh, we say that phi of x has a uh, Fourier series on this interval if the following holds. So if I can write phi of x as a sum of terms like we considered previously. Uh, so if I can write phi of x as a sub zero plus now a sum from n equals one to infinity of uh, a n of, of the cosine functions. Uh, so I have the, the cosine terms from before, plus some other constant coefficient. So let's say dn instead, uh, times sine of n pi over L x. Uh, right, and so now it's not it's not uh, it's not just a cosine series or just a sine series, but we're just combining the the terms for each n, right? So I have the n equals zero term over here, and then I have uh, the higher n terms, uh, right? And so these numbers are called the uh, are the the uh, Fourier coefficients. Right, and so there's going to be some collection of Fourier coefficients which correspond to the cosine terms and some collection which correspond to the sine terms. Uh, and so we're gonna have formulas which are very similar for, uh, to what we saw previously that will allow you to calculate what these coefficients have to be. Uh, so for, for about a, a, a week, you're going, we're going to have to keep distinguishing between the cosine Fourier coefficients and the sine Fourier coefficients and doing separate calculations to determine what respectively they're equal to. Uh, we're gonna see next week that there's actually a way to combine these together into a much easier fashion uh, using complex numbers or imaginary numbers. And so we're gonna have a lecture either beginning uh, next time or, or at the beginning of next week where we introduce complex numbers in more detail and talk about how to simplify a lot of the calculations we're doing here. Uh, so if a, lot, if a lot of these calculations seem to you to be maybe like over, overly long or redundant or something like that, we're going to simplify them, them soon. But in order to motivate what we're going to do, it helps to first look at, at this, this, particular, uh, this particular case. Uh, right, and so just as with the cosine series and the sine series, for the, for the full Fourier series, we still have... Uh, certain orthogonality properties. So I'll write this as a, as a theorem. Uh, so we have the following additional orthogonality properties. Right. And so if I look at the integral from minus L to L, and let's say I take uh, the cosine, a cosine term, so cosine n pi over Lx. Well, what's the, the new addition here? We have to consider what happens if you not just multiply a cosine term times another cosine term or a sine term time, times another sine term. We have to see what happens when you multiply some cosine eigenfunction times some sine eigenfunction, right? And so it turns out that if I calculate this integral from negative L to L, uh, 
this is always equal to zero uh, for all n and m. Uh, right, so this is the, the, the new addition. And so similarly, we still have the, the previous formulas. Uh, so if I look at integral from negative L to L of cosine n pi uh, over L times x, Uh, times cosine m pi over l x dx. This is equal to zero if if n doesn't equal m, right? The the only difference being is we well we replaced uh, right. So this is negative l not zero, right? But otherwise it's it's the same thing. And then the, you'll do you can do the same calculation to uh, to check, uh, right? And so again since uh, since we've increased the length of the interval, we expect that in the case when n is equal to m, that the value of the integral should increase. And since we've doubled the length of the interval, it turns out that it actually uh, will double, basically because of the, the symmetry related to trig functions. So this ends up being uh, L rather than L over 2, right? But otherwise, it's the, it's the same thing. And so this is also true for if I have sine instead of cosine. Right, and so to prove this this last formula, it's the same same calculations we saw for for the, the case of sine Fourier series or for the case of cosine Fourier series, uh, and then the, the only new addition is is showing that if you have cosine of n pi over l times x times sine of m pi over l times x, that this is always equal to zero even if uh, even if n and m are the same number. So like the cosine terms and the sine terms are perpendicular or orthogonal to each other. Um, right, and so you can you can evaluate this this new integral using uh, using some more some more trig examples. Uh, so I'm I think I'm going to omit the the calculus. Uh, computation to show that this is equal to zero. Uh, this may seem like a bit of a cop out, like uh, it's like it's sure it's not immediately obvious how to how to show that this is zero. If, but if you if you work at it for a little bit, you can probably do it. Uh, however, the, the main reason I'm skipping it is because in the in a few lectures we're going to see a much easier way of, of proving things like this uh, using complex numbers, as I said before. And and in that case, I'll prove everything uh, directly. I'll do all the calculations for you. Uh, so, so just to save some time, and since we're going to have a better way to do this in a few lectures, I'm going to I'm going to skip this calculation. Uh, but it's not it's not too hard to to check. Um, right, and then finally we have a, a theorem which will look very familiar about uh, what are these coefficients actually equal to, right? So, what is a formula for a n, and what is a formula for for b n? Uh, so the formula is the following. Uh, so if phi has uh, a Fourier series in the sense above, uh, you must have um, a n is equal to 1 over l times integral from minus l to l of phi of x times cosine uh, of n pi over l x. Uh, dx, where n equals 0, 1, 2, uh, et cetera. And bn has to equal 1 over l times integral from minus l to l of, of phi of x times the sine term, right? sine of n pi over lx dx. Right, and so these are exactly the formulas we had from, uh, from the respective cases of Fourier and, and, and sine series. And so they reappear here when you look at the full uh, series combining these two things. Um, yeah, so, so I, I just realized that this, this idea of, norm, of absorbing the one half from before uh, turned out to not be very, very helpful of a simplification because all these formulas in the book uh, take into account this normalization. So if I change all these formulas, I'm gonna, I'm gonna confuse everyone. So I'm gonna retroactively go back and Pretend that didn't happen. 
And, and in that case, if I right, if you if you normalize the coefficient a zero in this way, then these formulas are valid also for n equals zero. I mean, it's in any case you can always you can always check just by calculating in the integral. It's 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 not a, a big thing. It's not as big of an issue as I'm making it out to be. But I, I don't want to I don't want to confuse people. So for for us, let's let's continue with the books notation and have one half a zero for the, for the first term. Um, Right, and so how do you find these formulas? Well, these formulas are derived in exactly the same way as for the, the cosine and sine series because we have the crucial orthogonality relations, right? So let's say, for example, I wanted to find, um, let's say I wanted to find a n, right? Well, let's integrate my function from negative L to L phi of X against the this cosine term. So against cosine of N pi over L times X dx. Well, let me expand phi into the Fourier series. So this is going to be sum from N equals zero, or let's say sum from N equals one to infinity uh, An or sorry, integral from minus L to L of uh, a n times cosine of uh, right. So let's sum from M, not not sum from N. Right, so expanding phi as, into the uh, as a as a Fourier series, this is equal to a m uh, times cosine of m pi over l x. So the term from corresponding to this value plus uh, b m uh, times sine of m pi over l x, all multiplied by this cosine term uh, d x. And then we also have to have the, the term corresponding to, to n equals zero. So plus integral from minus L to L, uh, one half a zero times cosine of n pi over L x dx, right? So this looks like kind of like a compu computed calculation, but let's, let's distribute everything. So I have the first term uh, corresponding to the a zero piece, right? And then I'm left with well, okay, well I have this this sum m equals one to infinity. This integral is going to break up into two pieces. So I have integral from minus l to l, uh, a m uh, times cosine of m pi over l x times, well, let's, let's distribute, so cosine of n pi over l x dx. And then I have the other piece corresponding to the bm terms or the, or the sine terms. So I have m, sum from m equals one to infinity, integral from minus l to l, uh, uh, bm times bm uh, sine of m, pi over L X times cosine of M pi over L, I'm sorry, N pi over L X uh, DX, right? So that was kind of long-winded, but all I really did was just plug in, right? So we're assuming phi has this Fourier series. So let's just plug it into this integral for phi, replace phi by that series and break everything up. And that's all I did here, right? I didn't do any, any other math. Uh, okay, well, we have these orthogonality properties. And so what these orthogonality properties will imply is that every single term in the expression I just wrote out is going to be zero except for one term, right? right. So every term is zero except uh, where m is, uh, m is equal to n, right? And so this is the, the orthogonality. And so let's let's just suppose, for example, that that n is not zero, 
if it's equal to zero, you have to handle that, that term separately. But let's suppose it wasn't zero, just to simplify matters a little bit. Uh, well, then we end up with, uh, integral of phi of x times cosine of n pi over l x dx. Well, it's only equal to the terms when n is equal to n, so I get uh, integral minus l to l of a n times cosine n pi over l x squared dx. And then I have the cosine and sine term, so minus uh, plus the integral from minus l to l of bm uh, sine of m pi over l x times uh, cosine of n pi over l x dx. Sorry, that should have been an n. All right, multiplying those. Uh, but we had this additional orthogonality property for the uh, for combining sine and cosine terms, right? So this was this theorem over here. So this last integral is also zero. Right. So this is also zero. And so therefore we end up with, uh, uh, this is equal to a n times, well, if I integrate cosine of n pi over L x squared, I get uh, L, right? And so now if I divide by L on both sides, I get a n is, is one over L times uh, integral from minus L to L of, of phi of x cosine of n pi over L x as, as claimed. Right, and so this is a particular example when n is not zero, how to calculate, like how to explain why this formula works for a n. Uh, if that was, again, too long-winded, uh, it's really just the orthogonality properties, right? You can, you just plug in the Fourier series for phi. All of the terms are gonna be zero except one term, and that term will have a n or b n, depending on if you plug in a cosine or a sine term. And then you just normalize or divide by the constant and then you, you get the formula, right? And so one, one good thing to remember is that if you, sometimes it's hard to, to exactly remember what the, the formula is for these coefficients, like is it a two over L or a one over L, et cetera. Uh, all you have to remember are these orthogonality properties and you can always rederive the formula very easily, right? Just doing this kind of sketch that I did over here. I know it looks like a lot of, there's a lot of sums and integrals. So maybe if I say easily, Maybe that, that's not going to be read in, in, the, in, the, in the, the best way, but uh, it's easy in the sense that all the terms vanish except for, for one term, right? So there's not really much going on here once you know that there's the orthogonality because everything is basically zero except for one term. And so that's the sense in which it's easy. Uh, okay. All right, and so what we're, what we're gonna do to end the lecture today and also we'll, we'll do some, a little bit, we'll continue this uh, at the start of the next lecture is, is start calculating some examples, right? So let's look at some, several examples of how to actually calculate these things. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, all this is really going to end up being is just some possibly painful review of, of various integrals involving trig functions, right? So this is really what these, these problems reduce to if you wanna actually calculate these coefficients. Uh, right, but before I want, before we go into these, these examples, I just want to finally introduce uh, one last definition, uh, and then we'll we'll turn to the to the example. Sorry about that. Okay, so let's in order to motivate this definition, let's just go back to. Um, this theorem briefly. Uh, and so notice here, we're assuming in this theorem that the function phi that we're given has a Fourier series in the sense that I know that phi of x is equal to this infinite sum of, of sine and cosine terms, right? Plus some a zero term. Um, and assuming that phi had this form, we derive the formulas for what a n and b n have to be uh, using the orthogonality properties. Uh, so these things are usually called the, the Fourier coefficients, as I said before. Uh, 
Well, let's suppose we don't know that phi has a Fourier series. So let's say we, we don't know if phi is equal to this infinite sum, right? Well, you can still calculate these coefficients, right? Uh, as long as phi is like a, for example, a bounded function, these integrals will always be, be finite, right? And so you can still define the Fourier coefficients even if your function phi doesn't have a Fourier series. And so that's what this, this definition will be, right? So suppose uh, phi of x is any function on, say, the interval between uh, minus L to L. Uh, uh, or there's an analogous version for uh, uh, 0 to L, which you can infer from this. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to write this, this definition for the interval from minus L to L. Uh, for the formulas I'm about to write, just replace minus L by 0, and then, and then they, they hold. Uh, Right. So the, the Fourier coefficients of phi are just a n and b n as before. Right. So the same formulas. Right. So again, the key, the key distinction is we're just given a function on the interval between minus L to L or possibly between zero and L where L is just some, some fixed number that's being given to you. Maybe L is equal to pi. Um, and we just have some function on this interval which may or may not satisfy certain boundary conditions and may or may not be equal to the Fourier series that we've been, been looking at before. You can still define the Fourier coefficients and so the definition of the Fourier coefficients is take your function phi and just use these formulas. And these are the Fourier coefficients. Uh, and so going forward, the question for us will be, or one of the big questions for us will be, let's suppose we were given a function and we don't know it's equal to a Fourier series. Well, I can still calculate the Fourier coefficients, a n and b n, and I can still write down this infinite series up here. And so the question will be, well, one, does this infinite series converge, which is a hard question in general. And two, uh, is my function phi of x equal to the series uh, on the domain, right? And that's also a hard question in general. So it's going to take several weeks to answer. Um, right. And so, so typically when people, when you hear people talking about Fourier coefficients, they just mean for an arbitrary function on, on the domain, you can always calculate these coefficients. And this is separate from, from the claim that the function is equal to a Fourier series, right? So these are two distinct things. So right, for any function, you can calculate Fourier coefficients in theory, but not every function will be equal to a Fourier series uh, is the distinction. Okay. Okay, well, well with that, that definition in hand, let's turn to some examples. So I'll do, I'll do one example to finish the lecture today, and then we'll do a few more at the beginning of the next lecture. Uh, so let's suppose for the first example, say my function phi of x is equal to 1 on the interval, say, on 0 to L. Let's say uh, the open interval between 0 and L. And we want to find the, the Fourier coefficients. Uh, An and Bn. Right. And in fact, let's just do the, the sine, right? So we're only looking at the interval between zero and L, so let's find the sine Fourier coefficients. Uh, we'll do an example with full Fourier coefficients next time, uh, right? So it's just gonna be, say, an. Uh, right, well, by definition, we have an is equal to two over L times integral from zero to L of my function phi of X times sine of n pi over L times X with respect to X. Well, if my function phi of X is just one, this becomes two over L times integral from zero to L of sine of n pi over L times X dx. Um, 
well, this turns out to be an easy calculation. The examples we'll see next time were, are not so easy. Uh, so if I, well, now I just take this fundamental theorem of calculus and take the antiderivative, right? Antiderivative of, of sine is negative cosine, and I just have to take into account the, uh, the chain rule when I do this. So I end up with two over L times uh, negative cosine of n pi over L x times uh, L over n pi right, because I'm reversing the chain rule. And I'm looking at this between x equals 0 and x equals L, right? Right, and so this ends up being, um, well, let me pull out the negative sign, so negative 2 over L. And then I have, uh, let me actually pull out the negative sign and negative ln over pi. So I have negative 2 over L times L over n pi. And then I have uh, cosine n pi over L times L minus cosine of n pi over L times 0. Again, we're just using the fundamental theorem of calculus. And so this ends up being uh, negative 2 over n pi. And in parentheses, I have cosine of n pi minus cosine of zero, which is one, right? And so if I, well, if you remember, well, notice that, okay, if you look at cosine of n pi, this is not, well, if n, if n is equal to one, or sorry, if n is equal to zero, it's equal to one, right? But it's also true that if n is equal to two, cosine of two pi is zero, and cosine of four pi is zero, and cosine of six pi is zero, and, and et cetera. So this is one if n is even. Uh, what happens if n is odd? Well, remember, what does the graph of cosine look like? So this is zero, uh, cosine is zero at pi over two, right? And so at, at pi, it's equal to negative one, right? And then it goes up. And so it turns out that for every odd multiple of pi, cosine is negative one. Right, so if n is odd, right? And so what does this mean? Well, this means that if n is even, this is going to be zero, right? Because I'm gonna have one minus one. Uh, on the other hand, if n is odd, I get minus one minus one. So I get negative two over n pi times uh, minus one uh, minus one, which is, well, minus one minus one is negative two negative two times negative two is four, right? So I get four over n pi. Uh, and so therefore, uh, my coefficient a n, well, it's equal to four over n pi if n is odd. Uh, and it's equal to zero if n is even, right? So for, for this particular function, the, the Fourier coefficient, the sine Fourier coefficients are zero unless n is, uh, unless n is odd. And so that's the answer, right? These are the these are the sine Fourier coefficients for one. On uh, zero to L. Uh, so one interesting point is that uh, notice that it doesn't depend on L, which is not always going to be the case. I guess it's sort of expected because your function, the function phi is equal to one is the same everywhere, right? It doesn't really matter the, the L, uh, but in general, again, the, the Fourier coefficients will definitely depend on, on L in some way. Um, uh, right, and, and to, to end the lecture, I just want to finish with, with a question, which is related to, to you know, the, the big question in, in the study of, of Fourier series. Uh, so we've calculated these coefficients. Right, so we've shown that if, if phi is equal to one, the Fourier coefficients are a n as above. Uh, and so the question is, does this mean that the function one, this is my phi of x, is equal to the infinite sum from n equals one to infinity of a n times uh, sine of n pi over l x, right? Well, what does this mean? Let's plug in what we have. This would mean, right, and so this would be on 
on zero to L, right? This would mean that one is equal to, uh, well, let me just write this as a, as a, as a list of, well, I only have terms corresponding to odd n. So I have four over pi, when n is equal to one, I have sine of pi over Lx. Now, when n is equal to two, it's zero. So I skip to n equals three. So I have plus uh, four over three pi sine of, of three pi over Lx. And then I have, well, the n equals four term is zero. So I go to n equals five. So I have four over five um, pi sine of five pi over L x and so on, right? I just keep going, it's, it's an infinite sum. And so if we can solve this, this problem of, of like understanding when, let me, let me rephrase that. So, so if for this particular function phi, I can write phi as a Fourier series on this interval. I would need, it would mean that this sum of, this particular sum of different signs terms converges at, if, if I like add up uh, these terms in this way, they have to converge to one, right? So this, this oscillating sum would, would equal one for, for every point uh, x between zero and L. Uh, well, the thing to point out is that this is false if x is equal to zero or x equals L, right? Right, because if, for example, if I plug in x equals zero, I just get zero for every term. And if I plug in x equals L, I also get zero for every term, right? So if I look at sine of n pi over L times x, this is always zero if, if x equals zero or x equals pi, or sorry, L. Well, if I'm adding infinitely many zeros, it still adds up to zero, right? And so I would have one equals zero, which is not possible. Uh, so this tells you it's, it's not true. Uh, if x equals zero or x equals L, but this doesn't mean that it's false in between those points, right? It could still be true 